a princess. He he's just electrifying on stage and kind and giving and uh, understood me. He's he's a one off, uh, somebody who doesn't fit uh, any categories. And I, I, in my humble way, totally connect with him. And to lose him is for me the biggest loss of all. Because how many of us can keep going just being themselves? One off. And how how different was he uh, as a as a friend, as a person to the to the character that we all saw him play in, in various uh, comedies? Yeah, well, he was very electric. I mean, he did. I did a radio play with him after he'd had the ac accident. This is just my experience. There's like hundreds of people. Adrian Edmondson obviously lost a major major part of his life in a, in a very different way but um, he is big and bold and brash and unashamed and yet really sensitive just this biggest person and so sexy the sexiest man I think I've ever met in comedy and on my first Edinburgh festival I couldn't understand what these women, women were doing around him not speaking and that was my first taste of um, groupies I think he, he invented groupies well, Helen, I'm going to let you get back to your gin and tonics. Uh, well deserved. Thank you very much. Rory Bremner joins me now, comedian and impressionist. Um, Rory, it's an incredibly sad day, I think, for anyone in, in the world of comedy. Um, tell us the Rick Mail that you remember. Well, particularly of our generation, of course. Yeah. In a way, you know, he was one of those that kicked the door down, uh, and, you know, in the vanguard of alternative comedy. Um, I mean, if you've been around Edinburgh and sort of like, around about 1981, sort of around about then... I mean, there were so many, there were Alexis Bale, obviously, there was uh, Rick with Aid Edmondson and also with Andy De La Tour, and there was just so much energy, and Rick was at the forefront of that. And Helen has, you know, hit the nail on the head, um, even with the gin and tonics, she's absolutely square with the electricity, because he just, he just blazed, he was this fireball of creative comic energy. Um, I, I only sort of met him a couple of times once we did the, um, an episode of uh, Believe Nothing was a later sitcom that he did with Marks and Grant after the New Statesman. And um, he just just rehearsing it, and his eyes were blazing all the time. He had a danger about him. He was completely, he said there was something completely uncontrollable. Like he, he had the devil in him, really, in, in a comic um, sense. Uh, just, uh, and the first thing I did when I heard the news, I went back to a, a clip from a, a little known program called Weekend in Wallop that he did. It was, a, a, I think, um, a, a Sunday Times journalist years ago said, why have a festival in Edinburgh? Why don't they have it in Nether Wallop in the middle of June or something? <laughs> so John Lloyd, uh, the great comedy producer, said, said oh, it was Stephen Pyle's idea, that's right. And they said, well, why, why do we just have this comedy festival in Wallop? And Rick was uh, featuring in it. And you can find the clip now on the weekend in Wallop. And Jules Holland was on the piano and Rick was singing. <laughs> um, you know, it was that one, because I'm evil, my middle name is Jeremy. <laughs> I smoke marriage one, and I don't go to lectures because I'm evil. And I still play that now, and I've obviously played it today, but to, to, whenever I need cheering up, I play that or Ian Duncan Smith saying that the quiet man is here to stay. Um, it, those are the two that do it for me, but, but Rick on stage in the 1980s, and that was, that was in his first... Uh, in a way, he was one of the first, I think, comedians to take an extreme version of his own personality, you know, Rick. And, and turn that into a, a comic character, you know, rather in the way that um, Alan Partridge or Alan Murray, the, the pub landlord, it was, you know, Rick was an extreme version. He put into a lot of, into it, he said, a lot of things that he hated about himself, um, including this sort of, I read somewhere that this, 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 he couldn't say the letter R, uh, and so he played on that in Rick as a kind of, uh, almost exorcising it. But it was just this blaze of creating comic, comic energy, which... Well, that that's, uh, that was the sentence. When I asked you to come on the program, you emailed me back and you said he had such raging comic energy. And that that was the one thing I think you could really take from every part that he, he played. There was so much energy about it. And I suspect that a lot of his his most his funniest moments were probably improvised because I don't yeah. see how you can script that kind of energy. Well, I think, I mean, I looked at the Blackadder uh, sketch. There's, there's obviously there's a lot on, on Twitter. There's a lot of sketches around him. And one of the... Yeah, it's always one of the things when a comedian dies. It was the same with John Fortune a few years ago that, that people dig out the clips and they just mm. realise how funny they they were. And so you know, it's, it, you're you're desperately sad, but at the same time, you just think, God, you know, he 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 gave our generation, you know, people of our age, just the, the, the people sort of say today that what their childhood, what their teenage years would have been like without the young ones, without the, that amazing. Um, you know,